It's the boutique British manufacturer with the wildest sports car you've never seen. Bad names and bad luck couldn't keep this upstart down because they found the tried and true formula of fun. Less weight and... <gasps> More power, baby! <laughs> Everything you need to know to get up to speed on TV. Unless you're British or into club racing, you may have never heard of TVR. The odd looking little sports cars are legendary for cramming giant engines into featherweight chassis and raising hell on the track. But thanks to bad luck, poor business decisions, and even more bad luck, now they're just trying to claw their way back in a 21st century that's traded visceral bliss for stats and Nurburgring times. It all started in 1946, when a 23-year-old chap by the name of Trevor Wilkinson opened up his first automotive garage in Blackpool, England. He called it Trev Car Motors, which kind of sounds like a five-year-old made up car company name. About a year later, when he was six, his buddy Jack Picard joined him. They renamed the company TVR Engineering. Sure, that was just the first, middle, and last letters in Trevcar, but at least it sounded like adults were in charge. Instead of focusing on working on other people's cars, they started developing their own. And by 1949, TVR had built most of its official first car, the TVR number one. These guys are awesome at making names. This rear wheel drive car was Frankenstein together using an 1172 cc side valve engine from a Ford van and the live axle springs, dampers, brakes, and steering from a small British family car called the Morris 8. With the rolling chassis complete, they hired coach builder LaSalle Les Dale, sorry. Les Dale to body the car. And that's where TVR's long history of no good, very bad, astoundingly awful luck begins. You see, before Les even got the body on the car, he crashed it. The guys were able to repair the chassis and Les managed to make the car look like a million bucks. Well, actually he made it look like 325 British pounds because that's how much Trevor's cousin paid for it. But ever the optimists, Trevor and Jack set to work building the better TVR chassis, sourcing running gear from various manufacturers like Austin, Ford, and MGs. And in 1955, TVR developed a new semi-space frame with a backbone. It allowed the driver to sit in the car rather than just on the car. Whoa. With the driver's booty toot only six inches off the ground, the center of gravity was low and that improved handling. TVR paired the new frame with the VW Bugs independent suspension, which ensured it stayed glued to the track. Cause you know, Bugs are known for their handling. Now this new short wheelbase chassis paired well with several engines, the most notable of which was the Coventry Climax <laughs> FWA. The FW stood for featherweight and it was a popular engine for small open top racers because it offered lots and lots of hearse purrs per pound. An American racer named Ray Seidel ordered several TVRs with this engine pairing and wrapped them in beautiful aluminum bodies. And it worked because Ray started kicking on the tracks of his home state of New Hampshire. And people were noticing. They were like, live free or die. That guy's fast. So fast, in fact, that Ray partnered up with TVR to sell this little chassis in the US under the nameplate Jomar, which was derived from, I'm not kidding, guys. It was derived from Ray's two kids' nicknames, Joanna and Mark. It's as if Jomar and Trev Carr were always meant to be partners. With everyone in the TVR bubble pumped about the the Joe Mar, they started cranking them out and shipping them to New Hampshire. What's up, Turk? But they didn't really sell that well, which Ray thought was because it was kind of ugly. So he suggested that TVR build a fastback version, which of course they did because they're best buds bad at naming. And in 1959, TVR came out with the Grand Chura. They advertised it with the slogan, only 980 pounds and it outhandles everything. <laughs> handled great on the track, it didn't 
really handle great driving to the grocery store or to work or to church or honestly back then the only places you really drove to were grocery stores work and church you get my point it wasn't a very good daily driver wasn't very good around the city and in 1962 tbr engineering went bankrupt Fortunately though, TBR had a side hustle engineering company for exploiting tax loopholes, which was aptly named Granchura Engineering. Uh -huh. This associate company took over production of the Granchura and started a tradition of making huge publicity splashes. The first being an expensive leap into the 24 hours of Le Mans that same year. <sighs> what a swing. <laughs> They entered two Grand Chiras with MG engines in the two liter class at Le Mans and were excited to see how the plucky little cars would perform. But they must have knocked over a salt shaker and driven under a ladder because they failed. Both cars were crashed and hastily rebuilt just before the race. One Grand Chira didn't make it to the start and the other one was the first car to be retired because it overheated after only three laps. And just a few months after their embarrassing outing at Le Mans, a Ford dealer from Long Island by the name of Andrew Griffith reached out with an idea that would change TVR forever. <laughs> Andrew loved the Grand Chira chassis, and seeing the success Carroll Shelby had with his AC Cobra, he thought he'd cram a 289 small block V8 into the TVR. The only problem was that it didn't fit. That's a big problem. So he asked TVR to make a special chassis to accommodate the power plant, and in 1964, the Griffith was born. Just keeping this naming tradition alive. What's the name? Griffith, although I don't have a lot of room to talk. I did name my car the Pump 3502. The Griffith was a bona fide home run and orders poured in for the Cobra Killer. But TVR's luck wasn't quite good yet. And a series of dock strikes in both the US and England made it hard for TVR to ship Griffiths to the US. And since TVR couldn't sell cars, they couldn't pay Ford for the drivetrain. So Ford was like, yo dude, you're cut off. And TVR had to shut their factory. <laughs> However, TVR already had a concept car designed by the Italians called the Trident, named after the gum. And they scrapped all their money together to show the Trident at the Geneva Car Show in March of 1965, where it grabbed the attention of Arthur Lilly and his son, Martin. Now the Lillys had engineering backgrounds and a business assembling Lotus Elan kit cars. They already owned shares in Granchura Engineering, and when they heard TVR was going under, the Lillys decided to buy the company and turn things around. The Lillys immediately hired a guy named Jerry Marshall to drive the Griffith in races. And Jerry was sort of like the Ricky Bobby of England. And fans loved that he drifted corners and joked about driving tiny race cars, saying stuff like, I couldn't get my piss in that car. <laughs> That's hilarious. Can you imagine freaking Jimmy Johnson being like, yeah, man, it's a good race out there. I couldn't get my piss in that car. Okay, back to you in the studio, Rutledge. <laughs> Not only was he hilarious with his peeps in the car jokes, he also won a lot. Now, TVR leveraged Gary's success to launch the Vixen in 1967. For the Vixen, TVR took a step back from the V8 crammed in a small car formula. So the Vixen came with smaller engine options, ranging from super light 1300cc, four bangers to V6s. Now they were selling between five and eight cars a week and business was definitely good, but not great. And TVR decided that the brand needed to make another big publicity splash. So. They hired model Helen Jones to pose naked with the Vixen at the 1970 British Motor Show. And it was a huge success because of course it was. The Vixens went flying off the shelves and everyone was excited to see what TVR had planned for the next British Motor Show in 1971. And guess what guys? They did not disappoint. They rolled out two new cars, the Zanti and the M series, okay? And since now there were two new models, TVR figured, hmm, maybe two naked girls? <laughs> Now you might be asking yourself, because I did too, how much naked is too much naked? If you ask no one, there's no such thing. But if you ask people at the British Motor Show, the answer is two. 
The show threatened to ban TVR for life, but it was all worth it. Orders for TVR M series has started rolling in. It seemed like nothing could stop them now. That's a good story. That's a, like, you keep doing it and then it happens, you know? And then their factory burned down. Oh, you gotta be kidding me, man. I know. So they're low on dough, and they needed to rush to debut their newest car, the Tasman. The Tasman was designed by former Lotus man Oliver Winterbottom, and yes, that is the most adorable names that these lips have ever uttered. Winterbottom's wedge design was a complete departure from previous TBRs and was not particularly well received. In fact, TBR boss Martin Lilly described the car as a big disappointment, which is also how my dad describes me. Now, as they say, timing is everything. And TVR's timing sucks. Okay, the commercial launch of the Tasman in 1980 coincided with a huge recession in England. And at this point, Martin had had enough. So he sold the company to another TVR enthusiast, a guy named Peter Wheeler. Now, under Wheeler's management and the British recession, TVR didn't sell a lot of cars, but they did win a bunch of races. In the Tasman's last year of production, the higher powered 450 SEAC variant won 21 of the 24 races that it entered. Fast forward to 1986, TBR debuted the S series. They threw away the wedge design no one liked, good idea, and returned to the classic looks of the successful M series. The base model V6S was a huge success for daily drivers and weekend racers alike, and the optional V8S became a bucketless car for enthusiasts. The V8S went from zero to 60 in only 4.9 seconds, which is faster than the Ferrari Testarossa, the Lotus Esprit, and the Porsche Carrera 2. The 90s was definitely the best time for TVR, and it looked like all that bad luck Luck was a thing of the past. Oh, good. You know, these guys have really been through it. But you know what? They stuck to their scruples and they got through it. <laughs> I don't know. They even brought back the Griffith nameplate in 1991, along with a luxury version called the Chimera in 1992, and a 2 plus 2 coupe in 96 called the Kerbera. Me and my sisters used to love to play with Kerberos. TVR also manufactured their own engines for the first time. The AJP6 and the AJP8, better known as the Speed 6 and the Speed 8. Then in 1999, TVR debuted the Tuscan, and the styling of this car was bonkers. It looks like a Dodge Viper had a baby with a spider. All right, the headlights were a bunch of different eyes, and the taillights were mounted super low right above the exhaust. The turn signals were on the B pillars, and the door handles were buttons under the side mirrors. There were also two hoods. One small one that gave you access to almost nothing, and the second one that was bolted down. A hood that's bolted down. Well, the battery just happened to be mounted upside down under there and exposed to the underside of the car and debris would get in it and light the entire engine bay on fire. <laughs> With no way to put it out without unbolting the hood first. If you would be so kind for your own safety to move away from that area where the smoke was drifting. Then in 2003, TVR debuted their last new model you can actually get in and drive, the Cigaris. Now the Cigaris was Wheeler's swan song and the epitome of everything TVR had become under his ownership. At 2,300 pounds, it weighed the same as a new Miata, but under the hood was a 406 horsepower, naturally aspirated inline six. <laughs> That's amazing. Now it's at this point that you may be wondering, James, why haven't I seen any of these new TVRs at Cars and Coffee or on Bring a Trailer? Well, it's because of Wheeler's stubbornness and questionable business decisions. He didn't like ABS, right? He didn't like airbags. He didn't like stability control because he thought that they gave drivers a false sense of security. And as a result, you can't drive these cars in the US, which is the first time TVR's bad luck became our bad luck. Trippy. 
Right after the debut of the cigars, Wheeler sold the company to a Russian banker named Nikolai Smolensky. And under Nikolai, no new models have come out. Now in 2013, Nikolai sold TVR to some British businessmen who formed TVR Automotive Limited. While they primarily aim to provide parts for classic TVRs still on the road, in 2017, the group did debut a brand new Griffith, featuring a Cosworth enhanced five liter V8 borrowed from a Ford Mustang GT. TVR said the car would go on sale in 2019, but check your calendars, that didn't happen. I guess the only people with worse luck than TVR are the auto enthusiasts that love them. I wanna give a big thanks to Keeps for sponsoring this episode of Up to Speed. Keeps offers scientifically proven treatments, both over the counter and prescription, that can help fight the symptoms of hair loss. I think we'd love to know, James, what is the number one symptom of hair loss? I'm glad you asked. The number one symptom of hair loss is losing your hair. Keeps treatments are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. It has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and nearly 100,000 men trust it for their hair loss prevention medication. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash up to speed 50 to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P. S dot com slash up T O speed 50. Support the breads that support Dota. Keeps.com Keeps slash up, up to speed, to speed 50. 50. Receive 50% off your first order. Thank you guys so much for watching this show and everything else on Donut Media. I'm really uh, excited to tell you guys about our podcast. It has its very own YouTube channel. There's a link down there. We do a two-part series on the Midnight Club, the legendary underground racing syndicate, and we deliver a message to the American public from the Midnight Club. Thanks for watching. I love you.